Thank you. So who finds this annoying with the title not quite fitting properly? Uh, this sort of thing's quite easy to write. And the problem with QML is very easy to write, which means people who shouldn't be writing code tend to write interesting QML. So about me, I work for a company called Blue Systems, and I'm sponsored there to work on KDE. And I spend most of my time working on a downstream project fixing upstream code. So I work for a distribution fixing things that are wrong in Plasma. So I see a huge amount of code that's not my code. I have to go and fix it. And it's the same mistakes coming up over and over again. So quick talk, just going over three of the most common things that I always see again and again. And they're so easy to catch up with view times if you know to look for them. I had one person in a review ask me what QML lint I was using to find his mistakes. It was just reading. So what makes good code? It's obviously subjective. I mean, some people like it being fast to write. People like languages that are fast to write. And languages that perform well is good. So code that runs super fast, that's good. And code with awesome particle effects. There's some in the background, but are very faint. It's a wobbly stuff. That's also good. But is it good code? The important thing for code, in my opinion, which I'm now sharing, is readability. Is this ancient Roman proverb it's on their MSDNA website. Code is read more often than, is, and more often than it, is, it is written. So writing isn't the important part. It's how easy it is for somebody else to read it. Because people read that code again and again and again. Even if they're not touching that particular code, they'll be touching code near it. They need to understand that original code. And there's an extra part to this quote that says, it may even be you in 12 months' time. And you have completely forgotten your code, and you need to relearn it. So you need to re even read your own code. So readability is very important, and that's what we want to focus on. And another quote, that's mine. Uh, good code is code that still works after somebody else edits it. Because anyone can write code at work. You test it, it works. But there's a difference in quality if somebody else can edit your code and then it still works. And it kind of reflects well on you. So I'm going to do an example of a very small app and the sort of thing that can go wrong. So this is an awesome app based on one of the cute examples from the website. There is a button. And I'm going to have to try and click it on the screen. It's a good application. You can clap if you want. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant app. Let's look at code for that. We have a text box. It's got an ID. It says message box. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> okay. And then we've got a handler. And because we have auto completion, typos get copied across. We're saying message box again, and we're changing a text. So that's a common piece of code. You all understand, you all agree that's going to work. We saw it work. That's some lovely code. Then another person's going to come along, maybe you, and that button's now complicated. It's got some more particle effects in it. It's got accessibility handling. It's now 200 lines of code. So someone's going to come along and split it into a separate component. So now your main.qml file looks like this. We have your text box with your ID, which is wrong. And we have our component my button.qml, but our handler is still here. We still have this bit of code that says, on clicked, massagebox.txt equals I've been clicked. And that still works, because of the way QML component scopes works. Because this component is created by this component, it has access to all of the prop IDs and the root properties of column. It will still work. And if I were to run this code, it will still work. That's a lovely commit. However, Sebas comes along, and he's noticed that typo. So he opens main.qml, he sees this, he changes it, he does a search in that file for any other users of that ID, and he commits it. Well, you can do it with review, because even every reviewable tool we have, review board or Garrett or Fabricator, they show you a difference of code, and this file, even if you search all of this file, you're not going to see a mistake. Because 
The ID is not mentioned in this file, only once. So it's broken. So which commit caused it to break? The fact that you changed the ID to now be correct? Or rather, was it broken when somebody split that component and left this interlinking dependency between files? And I would argue, for the sake of readability, when you split files, you want to avoid this interlinking dependencies between them because it causes problems. And the main problem it has is now, instead of just editing out one file, all I need to know is that one file. I can search in that file. I can pretty much memorize one file. But when you have interlinking files, you have to memorize every single file in your project in your head at once and know which ID is linked to where. And every time you edit a file, you have to do incredible git magic and grepping to try and find where it could possibly be used. And this slows down your development considerably, and it can introduce those sort of subtle bugs that we saw in that very, very simple application. That one very small fixing a spelling mistake, and my amazing acting to know that that wasn't deliberately put there, causes these problems. And it does come up quite often, typically not in something as simple as this, but an if statement which is now referencing something which is undefined, you don't even see a warning on it. It will just pass by, unbeknownst to you, your code is no longer working. And you won't notice for several months until you get a user report that this obscure feature is broken. So what's a good policy for avoiding this? We know when we split out a component into myButton.qml, it can still reference IDs and properties from the component that created it. But that's not a good practice. It's very simple, but it leads to these problems. So how do you fix it? If when the person split out your button, they added a signal on the root and obviously passed, pop, passed the signal from the mouse, hand, mouse area to your root, main.qml now only references files within itself. You still have a dependency on the public header of button. You still depend on anything, any of your root properties. But that's no different to using any other component. You don't have that interlink that's going bi-directionally between the two files. So what we've done is moved all your logic that reference IDs from a component into being within the same file. And that is considerably easier to read, and it won't break as often. So that's one of the takeaway things from this talk, is only reference IDs within the same file, ideally. Yes. I mean, yes, but that's a lot easier to grab for because now all we're searching for, every time you change my button, you'd search for users of my button. And that's something that you can search for. Whereas searching the other way, it's backtracking doesn't work. So it's, it's something solvable. And that's something I would comment on with you if you change a public API of a product. Because there is no concept of public and private API in QML, but it's good to keep the root properties are handled differently. And this kind of does happen the other way around. If inside my button, we're now setting a text. I now have, I have a text inside my button. I'm referencing an ID. Again, I'm referencing an ID inside a component that's not mine. You can also get to the same problems. Somebody else will edit my button. Pardon? Um, okay, and you get the same problems again. You're still referencing, here's my ID with the button text. You're referencing IDs in another component. And so it, the problem goes both ways. So again, fixing it, it's a good idea to always move any properties that an external component wants to edit into being one of your root properties. Because that means you only have a small subsection of things to worry about when you change and that limits the amount of time to going to break it, either deliberately or accidentally. So when using QML, only reference components, properties that are in the root of a component. And when writing components, try and put anything you're going to want to change as a root property. And property alias is a really useful system. I assume most of you know it. 
you're not actually declaring a new property, you're just saying there is a property called this, and it, every time you set text, it will implicitly change the text of this ID here. So that's everything I wanted to cover with regards to good components. You want to write it um, as though they can be used independently, and making no assumptions about how they are currently used, because how they are currently used can change. Write every component as though it's a library. And weirdly, people do that for small things. For buttons, there are no mistakes. As soon as a project gets bigger, as soon as it's a big component, people seem to think your rules don't apply. So the more complex it is, the more people make it more complicated, which is bizarre. So general rule, if you're referencing ID outside a component, move some logic somewhere. And you should be able to open any component anywhere with QML scene. That's a good rule of thumb. And if you've got context properties, you can fake them with a dummy data folder. So any big component should be able to be opened independently with QML scene, and that helps your unit testing. If you have your interlinking, you can't write unit tests properly. So that was everything for components. Item geometry is another place where we often see quite a lot of mistakes. In general, each axis, horizontally or vertical, should have either two anchor points defined, like a left and a right, or a left and a width, or an X and a width, or be managed by layout, but never two of those at once. So I'm going to give some bad examples. We have an item, a focus scope. It has a left, it doesn't have a width, which means this rectangle here, which is filling a parent, will be completely invisible. And that's a quite a common thing to do, and when you're reviewing code, every time you see an item, just check it has all of the geometry set. And it's quite an easy thing to review. And this is another common thing I have seen several times, where people write anchor left, anchor right, and they set a width. One of those isn't going to do anything. And most of you know QML will know anchors get evaluated afterwards, but it's still unreadable code, because I look at this code and I would think, oh, I bet that width is 100 when in fact it's not. It's an undefined value. And finally, another thing that we see, a row layout will modify the positions of items. So this item is trying to change a left anchor, and the left, a left anchor changes the x of an item, a row layout changes the x of an item. You have two things trying to change the same property at once. And if you have two things trying to change the same property at once, you will either get one of them not working, or you'll get a recursive loop of doom. And a recursive loop of doom is something you generally want to avoid. That's probably worst case. Yes. And that's item geometry. You want to make sure you have all of the geometry set for every single item. Text in a box. This is where people get confused quite often, I think. Or something that comes up. So going back to before, we have a text, just an example. We have a text with a top anchor, a left anchor, and some really, really long string. What's going to happen when it's placed in a box of a fixed size? It's going to overflow. That looks rubbish. However, here we have, we're setting all your geometry. We're setting a left point, we're setting a right out point. Your text should be constrained within the box. Right? Yes, it looks like this. And the reason this happens is because although you've told it the size of the text ends here, you've also told it it needs to display as much text. So you have this interesting quirk that the item ends here, but it just carries on drawing anyway, which probably isn't what you want. You can set clip in the box, um, but generally that might not be what you want either. I mean, you've got all that vertical space, we want to wrap. So we've added wrap mode. So now what's going to happen? Now it overflows out your bottom. And that's not much better. So in this particular case, if we have a box of a fixed size which isn't growing to your content, which does happen if you've got, imagine, a list view or something such, you want to word wrap and delete. So your rules. And then it looks perfect. That's what we want from our text. 
So you probably want to set a width on the text, or grow your container to always fit the text. But given you don't know how big a text is going to be, particularly with German translations, it might not fit in the user's window anyway. So if you can't guarantee a text will fit horizontally, word wrap or a lead. And if you can't guarantee a text will fit vertically, you want to a lead. And one thing I have seen before, people thinking a lead and word wrap are somehow mutually exclusive. They are if you've only got one line, but in general, they're not. And I just want to show this code because it made me cry. Uh, it's a bit of code I saw in Plasma. It said, turn on a leading if we were going to overflow your box. And that's pointless because that achieves absolutely nothing. Because if it wasn't going to overflow your box, it wouldn't lead anyway. So that was just a remark. And this goes back to what we saw in the title, centering text. When people want to center your text, people think they should set a, a center anchor because you want to set that item in the middle. And that's not a good approach because it leads to what we saw in the title slide. It just overflows. And even though we've set word wrap, we haven't constrained a width, so it will just overflow. And there is a solution. You could explicitly set your width of the text to be either the size of the text or the size of the box, but that just gets complicated. A better way is to re envision how you imagine text. Don't position your text where you want your text to be. That's an amateur mistake. You want to position your text where a bounding box of the text should be. So imagine in Word, when you made that awesome Word art, you click and drag a box, and that box says, the bo this area should be full of text. You don't want to say where your text itself is. You want to imagine you're dragging that box in Microsoft Word or LibreOffice. So don't position your text, position the bounding box. And then within the bounding box, there are properties in the text object to position the text inside it. Just gonna have a pause. Yeah, had, had me gulping mic top. Sorry about that. Okay, final thing that I want to cover: width versus implicit width, because it seems. It's something that's quite easy to get confused over because it's quite confusing. So turning it from how cute describe it into words that I think are easy to understand, width is the size an item currently is, and implicit width is the size an item wants to be. Like, if I could be any size, that's how big I want to be. I get a lot of spam emails, which are basically the same as this. Um, the size an item... <laughs> wants to be. So typically speaking, the width will be defined by the size of your window, because the user is dragging a window, or the size of a scroll view. And it will be passed down from a parent to a child, which will pass it down to its children, which will pass it down to its children. Whereas the implicit width, the size an item wants to be, the size a window should be, goes upwards. We take the size of the text box, work out how big a margin should be, that's the implicit width for the button, and then that button's next to some other buttons, and these implicit widths go past upwards for your change. So it's based on the implicit size of your children and gets passed upwards. So directionally speaking, width gets passed down, implicit width gets passed up. And obviously, height is the same, but vertically. So an example of going back to your button, because we all love buttons for examples, Buttons and QML are Plasma's equivalent of clocks. We use them for examples for everything. We have an image, maybe it's a little icon, a little tick mark or something, and we have our text. And we want to work out implicit width of the button. We're setting this image to a fixed size, so we know how big this is going to be. We know it's got some margins. So we know it's going to be 20 pixels. It's always going to be at least 20 pixels up until the end of the image. But we don't want to say the width of the button is the width of the text. We want to say the width of the button, the width of the button should be the size the text wants to be, the size the text wants to be in order to fit. So it's, we take the implicit width of the text because the text can change. This is dynamic, the image is not dynamic, the text is. And then a little margin on the end. So that's a good example of how to write implicit widths. <laughs> 
But generally speaking, a lot of your Qt quick components will do this for you. Row and row layout will automatically calculate implicit width. Using row and row layout is so much easier than anchors for anything straightforward. Loader also sets implicit width. And if you're not sure whether to use width or implicit width, width is by default bound to implicit width. So if you're only going to implement one, implement the implicit width, because then when somebody else changes your item, your implicit width information is still available. Whereas if you only set a width attribute, if somebody else changes your width attribute, your information is lost, and you don't ever want to lose information. Um, pretty much near end, in case anyone's getting bored. Countdown. Um, a row will reposition items. A row layout will reposition and resize items. So if you want the size of items to change, use a row layout. If you just want items to be positioned, use a row. And that's a general difference, because I've seen people getting confused over that before. And we sometimes use row layouts a bit overkill. Final slide, binding loops. Reasons you have a binding loop warning in your code. You have a binding loop. <laughs> Questions, raise your hand. Here. Shouldn't any component also then have uh, implicit width, implicit height set by default? Um, so I, I think so. I think that's a generally a good, good advice. I mean, except for your item itself. Um, you'll find most cute components do. I think it's a good strategy to get yourself into. Even if you're not using it now, it's something that might be used later. Because right now, if I make like a little widget, so it's a spinner or something, I might know it will always be set by a parent component but it might not in future. So I think it's generally a good habit to get into, particularly if you've got anything dynamic inside that component. But implicit size on its own doesn't do anything. It's not a property that does anything. It's just sort of metadata for, for your item. Yep. Oh, you can shout, I can repeat it. Oh, yeah, anchors fill parent on a root item is, is generally bad because you want your geometry to be managed in a way that you can read. And if an item manages its own geometry, you'll get yourself... You can't, you don't, when you're reading the code which creates the item, you don't know where that item is going to be. So I would say you don't want to do an anchors.fill on any item. I think I did in some of my snippets because I was trying to show that it was just a snippet rather than adding its item on top. Wait, wait. Oh, hold wait. on. We have technology. Um. We had technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Sorry. Oh. Okay, it's all good. Okay, um, I have an QML component, uh -huh. which has an implicit size. Yep. And now I want to change something dependent on if the width property is set from the outside. So is uh, if... If um, the parent doesn't set with, then the behavior you is You have like... that implicitly. implicitly. Um, if you set an implicit width on a component, if your width is set externally, your width set externally will apply. However, if your width is not set ex externally, width is by default bound to your implicit width. So, so it will use the implicit width. So you get that whole concept of, I want to use my size unless it's been set externally. So if you set an implicit width, you will get that feature. And I can check if I uh, do something like if width unequal to implicit width, for uh, example. You or, could or, do. I mean, I don't. The thing is, I was saying you don't. I don't think you need to. I mean, if okay. in general, in your inside your component, you want to be using a width because you don't know how big you actually are. Because, as I said, width gets passed down from your parent, so any items inside your component should be based on the size of your parent, not the implicit size of your parent, because you might not be at implicit size. Okay. 
So I think in general, I don't know your specific case, but in general you want to base, base it on your current size rather than the size you want to be. Um, the, the case is I have a button which uh, should do its resize uh, based on the actual text that, that is set on the button. But I, I want to feature that the parent can say, you button, you, are, you have this size. Okay, and, so and the text should elide or wrap or whatever. So if you set the text to a lead, and then you set the button to have an implicit width based on the implicit width of your button, you will find that by default, if it's not set externally, the button will set fill, show the entire text because the implicit width of some text is the size of the text. But if it's been set externally, then you'll be shrinking a text and then it will be a leading. So you want to imagine that you could be a leaded, set a lead to true, but then pass up your implicit width to say, I want to be as big so I don't have to a lead. I have a QML I'm going to show you, actually. So this is implicit width of text, because um, implicit size of text is quite interesting, really. Implicit width of a text is the text it would be if it wasn't wrapped and deleted. So even if you wrap and delete a text, the implicit width is saying, how big can I be in order to not wrap? And then the implicit height is based on how high should the text be, assuming I'm wrapped, because wrapped is set, in order to not a lead. And it's treated as two almost in completely independent things because you don't want to set it to implicit width and implicit height because that blue box shows implicit size. But there's no point setting a text box to its full implicit size because that's both long enough to not, um, not wrap and long enough to not a lead if it was wrapped. So you can mix and match them interchangeably horizontally and vertically, don't they have to have the same style applied? Okay, one last question. You said that uh, if the warning, uh, I have a binding loop uh, occurs, I have a binding loop. But uh, how to avoid a binding loop if I have two controls uh -huh. uh, that set a value and also should display the value, like for example in a calendar widget where I can type in the uh, date or I can select the date by clicking on uh, um, day, for example. I, I don't know all of your code. I can't say uh, this. But in general, most binding loops can be avoided by saying use of implicit size and size independently. So you're saying, I want to be as big, but that's not relevant on my current size. And then you don't have a binding loop because you don't have my size is based on my current size, which is effectively what a binding loop is. Um, I've never seen a false positive. There's always been a way to avoid it, or it's been the false of something that I can't control, but we can at least identify it. I, I, I can't comment on your specific case. Maybe catch me afterwards. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you, David, for his nice talk. If you have more...